Breck has a, is it a master's in French? Yes, she has a master's in French, and also um, her cousin is Alex Gordon of the Kansas City Royals. So, she is very qualified to talk to us about stripping. How about now, Breck? First of all, Alex Gordon's not actually my cousin, but my last name is Gordon and I'm from Kansas, so I spent the whole road series getting free drinks by telling people that. <laughs> so, um, stripping is very on vogue right now. Um, with the revival of burlesque that started in the 90s, um, the documentary about Kathleen Hanna. She talks about her time as a stripper. That came out, I think, two years ago. Um, the I don't know if you guys heard of Bettina May, the burlesque artist who was granted a genius screen card last year, and that caused like a big media frenzy. Um, and also, the top song on the Billboard charts this week is Usher featuring Juicy J, I Don't Mind. And the first line of that song is, Shorty, I don't mind if you dance on a pole. <laughs> so, um, you know, between the burlesque revival, the economic crash, and the triumph of uh, Southern rap, everybody is either actively stripping or talking about it. So that's why I picked uh, this topic today. So uh, Vice sent last year a boring English girl to the one of the most notorious strip clubs in the country, Diamonds of Atlanta, and um, it's pretty painful to listen to her in the documentary. She says things like, ever since I was a kid, I've had this dream of going to ATL and dancing with strippers, like whatever. But the rest of the documentary is really good. And this was my favorite quote of the whole thing. Stripping is like eating a noisy bag of chips in church. Everybody look at you in disgust, but they really want some. <laughs> and I would say that sums up the entire history of stripping. It's kind of like love that you don't want to admit kind of thing about it. So, uh... First, I'm going to talk about the ancient history of stripping and then move into the history of stripping specifically in New York. Um, so Lupercalia is the origin of Valentine's Day. It was an ancient Roman um, festival during which two priests would be anointed and then everyone at the feast would um, feast and drink heavily. And then the rest of the day was um, these two priests would, well, at the beginning of it, they would sacrifice goats, and then the priests would make kind of whips out of the goat skins and spend the rest of the day running around whipping women with these um, goat whips. And this, <laughs> it was all about fertility, and so if you were lucky enough to get whipped by this goat carcass, which was called a februa, which is where February comes from. Um, you were bestowed with fertility. And um, there's no explicit record of striptease occurring during this festival, but we do know that fertility dances were a part of this and many other ancient traditions. And um, while the the dancing was designed to sexually stimulate and the ultimate goal was to gain favor of the goddess of fertility. And um, many involved draping oneself in animal fur and a lot also involved removing this animal fur. So that's kind of the base of stripping. And uh, moving on to the next Roman myth, the origin of May Day, Floralia. It is held in honor of Flora, the goddess of flowers and gardens. And um, it is the origin of May Day, like I said, and it's, again, related to fertility. And when it was introduced to Rome, it became characterized by like totally wild partying. So this is a, a painting of this festival. 
And um, goats and hares, which are highly sexed animals, were let loose on the last day of the festival. You can see them running around. And um, the celebration involved lewd games, dances, dramatic productions, including courtesans performing mimes in the nude, as you can see here. And by the time of Julius Caesar, striptease shows were being staged on theaters in the city. Now, another myth, this is Babylonian mythology, um, is the story of Ishtar. And a lot of people cite the myth of her descent into the underworld in search of her boyfriend as the first instance of stripping. So in this myth, uh, Ishtar approaches the gates of the underworld and demands to be let in. She says, if thou openest not the gate to let me enter, I will break the door, I will wrench the lock, I will smash the door post, I will force the doors, I will bring up the dead to eat the living, and the dead will outnumber the living. She is really serious about finding her boyfriend. <laughs> and, um, oh, whoops. So, um, the gatekeeper hurries to tell, hold on. Failing with these, uh, notes on the screen. I'm a Luddite here with my papers. Um, so the gatekeeper hurries to tell Arash Gagal, who's the queen of the underworld, about Ishtar freaking out at the gate. And Arash Gagal says to tell her that she can enter, but only in accordance with the rules. And the rules happen to be that she has to remove an article of clothing at each gate. So by the time she gets to the end, which is the seventh gate, she's naked. So when she gets to the end and she's naked, she's just totally pissed off and she throws herself on Arash Kigal and starts fighting her and Arash Kigal orders her servant, Namtar, to imprison Ishtar and unleash 60 diseases on her. Um, terrible. So meanwhile, all the sexual activity had ceased on the earth. Um, when, basically, when Ishtar descended into the underworld, everyone on earth couldn't have sex anymore because she was the goddess of love. And um, Ea, who essentially was like king of the gods, who was, there were a few gods that kind of ruled over all the other gods, it was like a parliament kind of thing. Um, but he was like the creator of life, so he was kind of like the main guy. And um, he caught wind of the situation, the situation being that no one could have sex. And he created an intersex being named Azushu Namir to send to the underworld to demand a bunch of stuff from Ereshkigal, notably the water of life. So she obviously doesn't want to give it over, but has to because the demand came from Ea. So she hands it over and Asushu Namir uses the water of life on Ishtar and brings her back to life because you know she was dead because she had 60 diseases. And <laughs> so she comes back to life, goes back through all the seven gates, um, comes out on earth fully dressed, and then everyone can start having sex again. So, yes, hooray. Um, also keep in mind this is like ancient Babylon, not biblical Babylon. Um, but my next story is from the Bible. It's okay, I don't need that. Um, so, the biblical origins of stripping come from the story of Salome, who's actually not ever named in the Bible. She's just um, referred to as the daughter of Herodias. But she danced before her stepfather, Herod, at his birthday party. Which, here's the Bible quote. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she wanted. And what did she want? She wanted the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So that is why John the Baptist was killed. And, um... The reason that the family hated John the Baptist so much is because uh, he spoke out openly against the marriage between Herod and Herodias because it was against Jewish law, there was a messy divorce involved, I just, whatever. Whole other thing. Anyway, so, um, people cite this so story as the origin of stripping, but there's no explicit reference to the dance being sexual in nature or revolving around the removal of clothes. 
But the reason that people think this is because of Oscar Wilde's 1891 play Salome, in which he gives the stage direction that Salome performs the dance of the seven veils, which here she's performing the dance. This is a painting by Georges Rochecloz. Um, anyway, so the concept is believed to be derived from basically just the kind of general um, Orientalism that was popular in Europe and America at the time. So then in 1905, Richard Strauss um, debuted his opera Salome, which was based on the Oscar Wilde play, which was based on the Book of Matthew. And um, during the, so she very explicitly performs this dance of the seven veils in which she does remove the veils one by one and at the end she's nude in front of Herod. And that's when she demands the head of John the Baptist as payment and upon, upon receiving it, she declares her love for John the Baptist and kisses the severed head. Uh. Horrified, Herod orders her execution. So this opera is in a way, um, the culmination of all of these myths, but a lot darker also. Um, and in her book, Sisters of Salome, Tony Bentley examines the cult of Salome, which she calls Salomania, um, that was going on at the time in the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, that was just related to this whole kind of Orientalism interest. So now we are in the 19th century. And many popular dance styles at the time beca began veering more and more towards striptease. For example, in 1927, Madame Francisque Dupin, oops, skipping ahead. Um, so, Dupin was a French ballerina, and she premiered at the Bowery, um, which was the premier theater house at the time. Um, she performed in New York for the first time, and she scandalized her American audience because instead of wearing tutus that were kind of very conservative and covered a lot, like think Degas paintings, um, instead of wearing that, she wore like a thin, very flowy dress, and so when she would dance and spin and kick, it would, you know, parachute up. And um, very scandalous, sh exposed her whole, you know, middle region. And um, let me find. So, a review in the New York Observer of her 1827 performance noted that, quote, the exhibition is to all intents and purposes the public exposure of a naked female. And people were outraged, but despite this controversy, she was wildly popular, and um, within a few years, that form of ballet was a totally respectable dance um, for the American aristocracy. Fast forward a few years later in the 1830s, and working class men were pouring into the city um, due to industrialization and immigration. And this changed the whole scene of downtown Manhattan because um, new forms of working class theater popped up to meet the demands of this new population that lived in downtown Manhattan, such as the Dime Museum, the Concert Saloon, and therefore the neighborhood around the, bow the Bowery became a lot grittier. Much to the dismay of Walt Whitman. In 1940, he points out that the standard of theatrical performance at the Bowery had declined. He wrote that year that, quote, cheap prices and vulgar programs came in. Several years later, in one of his newspaper columns for the Brooklyn Evening Star, he asked, what person of judgment that has ever spent one hour in the Chatham or Bowery theaters in New York, but has been completely nauseated with the stuff presented there? Um, which is, you know, an interesting view on stripping for someone who was born in Long Island and died in Camden, New Jersey. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sure that Walt was totally horrified when a few years later, in 1868, modern American burlesque was launched when Lydia Thompson and her Victorian burlesque troupe, The British Blondes, performed in New York for the first time. Um, their shows involve dancing, singing, comedy, um, parody, and um, they were wildly popular. 
and started the whole trend here. And at their peak in 1873, they had pretty much stopped referencing English plays altogether, which was kind of their original shtick. And um, they really just did, you know, like frenzied can-can dancing and their costumes and, you know, witty kind of slapstick comedy. Um, and then the, this type of show became incorporated in vaudeville in the 1880s, which lasted to the 1930s, and all of that. So, outside of New York City, including in New York City's boroughs, um, a major platform for the evolution of dance was on the stages of tented sideshows and traveling circuses. So these circuses had girl shows, is what they were called, and they were basically like belly dancing was what was popular at the time. Um, and the, the dances were called oriental dancing or muscle control dancing or the hoochie coochie, but they were all just belly dancing. And um, so, and the belly dancing obviously, you know, is, has been practiced in the Arab world since ancient times um, as a part of religious worship, fertility rights, all different kinds of things. And it's actually the Western interpretation of belly dancing that makes it this kind of temptress, seduction type of thing. That's like totally the Western imagined version of belly dancing. And um, the history of belly dancing's contact with Western culture is um, after Napoleon's first contact with Egypt in 1798. And by the 1850s, um, dancers from Egypt were going all around the world to perform. And so by the time the, the British occupied Egypt in 1882, belly dancing was already totally a fixture of Western entertainment industry and cabaret acts, circus acts, and theater and film. So, the hoochie coochie. It um, became popular in the late 1800s and well into the 1900s. It was described by the New York Journal as neither dancing of the feet or of the head or the feet, and was wildly popular in carnivals and circuses across America. So another name for it is danse du ventre, which in French just means dancing of the belly or like the mid region. Um, and so Fatima, who's pictured here, or the little temptress, she, a little tempest, sorry. She um, was a very famous hoochie-coochie dancer, and like a lot of those dancers at the time, she was allegedly Gawazi, which is an Egyptian race of traveling dancer that became popular among Western audiences. And in Coney Island in the 1860s, it was said that in various saloons and parlors, the girls pretending to be can-can dancers would do private dances without clothes for a dollar. Additionally, beach pavilion owners would allegedly hire girls to sit with patrons and encourage them to buy drinks, and then they would make a commission off of those drinks, which is essentially the business model of modern day strip clubs. And in 1896, a 30-second peep show film called Danse du Ventre, or Passion Dance, which was filmed at Coney Island, um, was said to be the most popular film in the peep viewers in an Atlantic City boardwalk arcade until someone complained and the authorities had it removed. So in the early 1900s, carnivals continued to increase in popularity and number. Um, these often, you know, had this oriental theme and they would claim that they were historical. They would be called things like oriental theaters, Turkish villages, or living picture shows. And when the operators of these were faced with criticism for lewdness, they would claim that the dances were, quote, merely historical presentations of the eastern cultures, <laughs> giving them educational value. So um, burlesque theater and carnivals continued to thrive into the 20s while jazz was added to the mix. And um, the 20s saw a major cultural shift in America as leisure, leisure and individuality um, really gained a lot of uh, value in the American conscious. And um, they shifted from an obsession with duty to an interest in you know, desire and individuality and the entertainment industry reflected these changes. 
Um, for example, the Charleston and the Shimmy evolved from the Hoochie Coochie and became the most popular dances of the time, not merely among performers, but among average people as well. And um, the carnival and circus dance performers had incorporated the tent poles into their routines, giving birth to pole dancing. They would call it the dance pole, which became pole dancing. And that eventually moved indoors. Um, burlesque theaters were opening rapidly in cities, and by the 30s, there were even burlesque theaters operating on Broadway. For example, the Republic Theater, which was opened in 1931 by the Minsky Brothers, um, which brought burlesque to a black tie audience for the first time. The theaters had already existed all around the city. The Minsky Brothers owned, um, I think, over like 15 of them. For example, the Little Apollo Theater on 125th Street. And this one was run by Morton, who was the youngest Minsky brother. And he gave his sketches titles like Julius Teaser and Panties Inferno, <laughs> um, which is testament of you know the tendency of burlesque to sprinkle the performances with high culture and also kind of the general tone of parody in a lot of these performances. And it's actually at a Minsky show that the term striptease was first coined by reviewers who were in the audience. Um, in 1937, Mayor LaGuardia put the Minsky brothers out of business for, quote, corrupting the morals of the city. And Morton Minsky, in a 1981 opinion piece in the New York Times, writes that he believes that LaGuardia, quote, did this not because of any ethical standards, but to gain votes for re-election through a sensational tactic which kind of sounds like Giuliani in Times Square. <laughs> um, so meanwhile, burlesque lingered on in other parts of the country and abroad, but within a few decades had become virtually obsolete. So now we're in the 1940s. Um, World War II made striptease patriotic with the emergence of pinup girls. Hollywood had fully embraced the aesthetics of striptease and sexuality is pretty blatant in pop culture and film was taking over for, line per for live performance at the time. In the 50s, adult movie houses replaced burlesque theaters, which is when burlesque kind of died for a while, and men's magazines like Playboy made images of nude women um, widely accessible. Pole dancing moved from tents at circuses into bars, and the concept of strip clubs increased in popularity at this time. These establishments were raided frequently for violating decency laws, but like most of most issues like this, the authorities eventually gave up on shutting them down entirely and just opted for enacting zoning laws. And the 60s and 70s saw America's sexual revolution in a society that had become more accepting of blatant displays of sexuality. Um, the tease in strip tease was pretty much going away um, due to full nudity becoming wise, widespread. And during this time, the mob's presence in the nightclub industry increased, and everyday fashion became much skimpier, like the mini skirt and hot pants. Um, the modern pornography industry was gathering strength, and in general, culture was becoming more okay with nudity. So from the 70s to today, the story of stripping has become less about aesthetics and technique and more a dialogue about workers' rights and feminism. Therefore, here's where my history of stripping ends. <laughs> um, we all know about modern pole dancing, no contact legislation, unionization of strippers, um, lap dancing, and even pole dancing as fitness. I don't know if you guys have ever seen one of those, like studios for fitness pole dancing. Um, but yes, so we all know all about that. And at this point, stripping very rarely involves any kind of tease or really any kind of stripping. It's just a certain type of dance performed at a certain type of nightclub. Um, that's what we associate with stripping. And the tease does live on in neo burlesque, popularized in the 90s by like Dita Von Tees and things like that. Um, but for the most part, the culture around stripping um, is, you know, what we all think of in these pictures. And um, so since the beginning of time, people have had not a love hate relationship with stripping, I would call it like a love anxiety relationship with stripping. 
and um, you know, with dance in general and with displays of sexuality in general. And so you put the two together, you bought stripping, um, which today is a $75 billion global industry. And in the United States alone, the annual revenue of strip clubs is over $3 billion. So I guess it's safe to say that love beat out anxiety on this one. <laughs> So I'll leave you with one final fact. In case you were wondering, the six largest US markets for strip clubs are Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, the Miami Fort Lauderdale area, Orlando, Las Vegas, and Los Angeles. So plan your next vacation accordingly. <laughs> Yes, but that is a whole other presentation. <laughs> it, I mean, like, you know, belly dancing, obviously, in that part of the East, but then, like, East Asia is a whole other kind of thing. But it all, it all emerged from dance. Yep. Uh, so many of the early references were just referred to as dances. Was there ever a point in earlier times when it was first known that it was I mean, people have always been kind of crazy about dance um, in Western culture because of religion. I mean, things like Footloose, even. Um, you couldn't dance in parts of Texas until the late 90s. So um, I don't think there's any like pivotal point during which um, that became wrong. It would just kind of, I would think it would just go along with kind of general um, opinions about nudity and like blatant expressed sexuality. Yep. Um, the numbers you quoted, was that for male and female strip clubs or just female? That was for both. Um, I, I read, I think that less than a third of strippers are male when did that start today. Being a thing? Male strippers? Hmm. I don't know. I'll, I don't know. I mean, it was in the 20th century, definitely, but I don't know, like, an exact year. Yeah. <laughs> um, not in the underworld. No, he wasn't down there. She went through all of that, and he wasn't there. So did, did he want to be found is the real question here. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone. <laughs> Here for Brett.